You brewers know the importance of chillers, which is why you're watching this video. If you wanna lock in that fantastic aroma of those zero minutes or whirlpool hops in your beer recipe, the way to lock that aroma in is to make sure you cool down fast. So this particular video is working out which chiller is gonna be best for you. Now, one of the simplest levels of chillers you can get, and this is where a lot of beginners start, is the immersion chiller. Now, the immersion chiller, one of the beauties about it is just so easy to use. Just attach the garden hose here, and your water goes in here, goes like that, and comes out the other side. Now, as much as these are really, really simple to hook up, because you've got garden hose, that's it, and you can use this for, you know, things like brew in a bag and stuff like that, where you haven't got a pump involved, this is still a really good option. You do have some constraints though, in the sense that when you start using an immersion chiller, you see a very fast drop off in temperature in the beginning. And as you approach your you know, water temperature, it gets harder and harder to keep cooling. One thing that helps a little bit is agitating the wort. So if you've got a spoon, you're constantly stirring the wort like that, um, as you're cooling down, that'll greatly increase the, uh, the, the, the speed at which this will cool down. But generally speaking, because this is such a beginner tool, which we generally have in the starting kits, most of you guys will graduate to one of these if you're really taking the brewing seriously and run to cool down really fast. So look, I'm gonna leave that one out of this uh, comparison for the rest of the video. Now onto the counterflow chillers. Now counterflow chillers are exactly what they sound like because essentially you've got wort, flowing in a counter flow direction to the water or the coolant, as you can probably imagine. Um, now, the reason why we flow in opposite directions is it's far more efficient. So let's say I had 100 degrees water and zero degree, sorry, 100 degrees um, uh, wort and zero degrees water. If I flow them in parallel like that, the best I could possibly hope for is there's 50 degrees Celsius for both of them at the other end. And that would be absolute best case theoretical maximum. Now, on the other hand, if you flow in a counter flow direction, you can actually have the wort come out at very, very close to the you know, water input temperature. So you can have like, you know, wort entering at 100 degrees and exiting at very, very close to zero if that's what your water temperature is. So they can be very, very close to 100% efficient if you're using this type of chiller. Obviously the efficiencies are greater if you slow the wort flow down. So if you slow the wort flow, you know, the wort is going through the coil or through the plates slower. And often a lot of people kind of overstate their efficiencies based on very, very slow, you know, flow rates through the chiller. So I think that's a bit unfair. So when people quote these, you know, over exacerbated 99% efficiencies and stuff like that, always get the full picture of how fast they're flowing, you know, the water and also the wort through the chiller to get that, you know, theoretical number. Anyway, the first one is the plate chillers. These used to be really, really popular, you know, about 20 years ago. Uh, this would be probably the most sold type of chiller. Um, look, it's fantastic used by a lot of breweries and a lot of breweries love them uh, because they're so efficient and you can whack down masses of amount of heat because you've got all these plates closely nested together. You can see how compact it is compared to all these. One major constraint though is hard to clean. Now, this particular you know, type of chiller, unlike the large brewery ones, which you can disassemble, you take some bolts and they've got gaskets between each um, you know, stainless steel plate. Uh, these particular ones don't have gaskets. These ones are brazed together with copper, so they cannot be disassembled. I mean, the compactness is nice. They're nice that they can bolt onto a brewery frame. So you've got these uh, M5 uh, you know, threads here. We can basically bolt that onto your frame, which is kind of cool. But ultimately, in my opinion, it's not my favorite because it's just impossible to clean. Now, some people would argue that you know, it doesn't matter because it's all hot side. So after you finish your boil, you're gonna run hot work through this anyway. So even if it's not sterile, it doesn't really matter. Heat's gonna kill everything. And really all of these, that should be your procedure. Always run hot work through the chiller for a good five, 10 minutes, or at least five minutes, I'd say, just to heat sterilize you know, the product before you start you know, turning the coolant water on and cooling it down. With that said, it's not that nice. I mean, if you take one of these apart after a few years of use, you get you know, chunks of black stuff in there. It's unavoidable, absolutely. No matter how you know, much you try to clean inside, if you don't take it apart to clean it, you're gonna get chunks in here and that tends to clog the thing up. And then every now and then you get a little bit of black stuff come out in your lager. Now, some people say they use like harsh chemicals to clean these, but really that's also, in my opinion, not advised. As I just mentioned, these are brazed together with copper. Copper being a soft metal, not ideally suited to things like acid, caustic cleaners and stuff like that, because it'll just eat through the copper and eventually you'll get little hot pinhole leaks start, starting to form in this one. So look, in my opinion, the fact that you can't really clean it, look, we're still gonna compare it in this video. We're gonna compare the heat exchange numbers, but in my opinion, that's not my favorite pick. 
So that brings us on to these, basically these counterflow chillers, uh, which are a coaxial type. So we call them coaxial because it's a tube inside another tube. So firstly, we've got this old one on the website. Now this is an older model. I'm not even sure if we're gonna continue to stock this one. This one was by far the cheapest, but we got a few people saying that, you know, it was a bit too cheap because, you know, the braided vinyl on the outside didn't hold mains water pressure. So some people, if they accidentally pressurized the coolant jacket on the outside of the coil, they could pop the joins off. Kind of annoying, you can rejoin it with a hose clamp, no big deal, but uh, generally that was user error. In our instruction manuals, it always said, you know, control the water flow on the inlet side, so you're not putting mains water pressure on the PVC outer jacket. But with that said, we have actually, through that sort of user response, ended up making this PEX chiller. So this one's got PEX on the output, uh, on the outside, uh, and which can handle mains water pressure, and as does this one. The other thing we had a small complaint for what was, was some people pull these apart like that, and as you can see, that it's just like a big slinky spring. So they're not that robust, and some people could kind of bend them out like that, wouldn't be so good. So this one, Look, even though it was really inexpensive, it may possibly be on the way, way out. So if you see that taken off the website at some stage, stage don't be surprised. Um, these two here, I think are fantastic options. So we are gonna do a, you know, a temperature comparison in all three of them. Just in brief, this is called the Colossus. It's a stainless steel. It's Colossus also because it's pretty large. Um, you know, this bolts well to a stainless steel frame. If you've got a big brewery frame or something like that, you can bolt it on. The Colossus is the only one out of this lineup which is completely stainless steel. So if you've got a big brewery and you're like, oh, I want everything to be stainless because I'm gonna use harsh caustic and you know acids and whatever, then really you gotta go for this bad boy. So you can chuck any chemical at this thing um, and that's awesome, but it is a bit more bulky and you know it may not be as good heat exchanger as these other two. Firstly, it's stainless steel tube. The stainless steel is quite thick um, and it's made thick enough so we can weld it and it's robust enough that we can bend it into a coil and so forth, but that has constraints. We've got a couple different designs where it has one and a half inch TC and half inch thread um, like that and some of them where they just got half inch thread on both. Our particular one is quite long. This is a nine and a half meter beast. So there are ones which are much smaller and compact. So always look at the statistics. I would say ours for a stainless steel coil is a bit on the longer side. And really in our opinion, that is necessary because stainless steel is not as, as conductive as copper. And therefore we really felt that long nine and a half meter length was critical with this type of chill up, even though it does make it pretty bulky. Now, the last one's a Red Reaper. This one actually recently just hit the website. It's a combination of copper, as I said, PEX as well, so it can hand, ma handle mains water. It's also got a handy little feature with this hook here as well. So this hook basically flips up from the inside, so it just basically flips up like that. So you can actually hang this on the side of the Brazilla just like that. So it hangs on the Brazilla, uh, and that, that way you've got somewhere to put it because um, you, know, you can imagine you've got all hoses attached and you don't want it really like sliding all over the place. Because sometimes you can have somewhere rigid to hang it or somewhere to set it, um, you know, it's a bit nicer. This has also some other cool features on it in the sense that we also have a little thermo well. So this T-piece, it doesn't, it's not just like a standard duotite T-piece. This one has a special size like little bung hole here where you can get a thermometer. So what you can do is get a thermometer like this, poke it into the T-piece like that, so you can actually measure the wort output temperature as it's coming out of the chiller. Now that is a really nice feature. Another thing you can do, if you happen to be using this Bluetooth uh, thermometer, you can actually link that up to your Brazilla and that way it feeds the temperature to the Brazilla screen, but then it also logs onto your um, you know, brewing profile for that day. So if you've run a profile, it'll save it on the graph and you know exactly what temperature your wort was coming out and it saves it on the wrap platform for you, so it's kind of nice. But, you know, it does fit a wide range of other thermometers. If you didn't use this one, it fits like um, also our uh, instant read thermometers. You've got like a range anywhere from like down to three millimeter up to about four and a half millimeter, you can put through this bung hole here, and then you'll get a temperature reading on the output. 
Um, also, this one we sell just as the raw chiller on its own. I'd recommend getting the one with the fittings and duotite stuff on here. That way you've already got the garden hose fittings. You've got a ball valve to control the water flow rate, which I think is kind of a bit important. And then, um, you know, it comes with that T-piece as I mentioned before. Anyway, let's do a comparison between these three and let's see which one is the best. Okay, so this is gonna be our test rig today. This is a 100 litre Brazil. It's the same one that I use myself for a lot of brew days. Um, the reason why we're using the 100 litre Brazil is firstly, it's got a large 100 litre capacity, so large thermal mass, so the temperature's not gonna fluctuate too much when I'm turning the coolant water on and off and that type of thing. The second thing is it's got a massive um, six kilowatt or over six kilowatts worth of power down the base here. So when I crank this up, I'm not going to see too much fluctuation in temperature. It'll easily be able to keep up with any cooling. The third thing is, um, there's, this one also comes with a relatively powerful pump. So when I basically get the pump going, it's going to basically be able to keep up with these particular tests. So when I do these tests, I'm going to flow the wort fairly fast. So I'm going to try to aim for real life testing, sort of around about between three and five liters. Look, we'll see what we come up with the end. I'll keep track of all those flow rates and I'll flow the water pretty quick as well, around about five, five and a half liters. Now, certainly it could be more favorable if I flow the wort really slow. I'll get up to those, you know, 90, 95, 99% efficiencies, but I want to get real life testing here. So I'm going to flow the wort at a fairly fast pace because that's what I do on my own personal days when I'm trying to punch through a brew day as fast as I possibly can. Anyway, there's not much point for me to record this next bit. I'm going to take down all the statistics and I'll get back to you at the end of this and we'll compare the results. Now, also with the testing, I have to put the caveat in there that I'm doing all this testing with the boiler being at pretty much boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius or 210 degrees Fahrenheit approximately. Um, but in real life situation, the chiller would not be chilling down that much. Generally, what you would do is get the chiller, recirculate the wort back into the boiler and drop the temperature of the boiler down to at least 80 degrees Celsius before you then chill the wort and go into the fermenter. Now, there's two reasons for that. Firstly, that you lock in more of the aroma. So if you've got zero minute whirlpool hops and stuff like that, you want to chill those um, whirlpool hops down at least sub 80 degrees because you reduce the amount of blow off of aroma to atmosphere. Secondly, the other thing is you want to get below that 80 degrees because that's below the uh, significant isomerization point and isomerization that is obviously turning the hops more and more bitter. So always recirculate back into the boiler, drop it to 80 degrees and then go into the boiler. But for this testing, we wanted the most aggressive test and we wanted to go straight from 100 degrees to see how much heat we can absorb with the chiller. But in reality, your results will probably be slightly better than this. You'll probably get slightly lower chilled work temperatures in the fermenter if you drop to 80 degrees first. Clearly. Now the testing parameters were as follows. For the tap water temperature, chilly old Melbourne in May as the tap water temperature of 9.3 degrees Celsius, so that was pretty good. The wort temperature on the other hand, I kept pretty close to the 99 degrees, varying plus or minus by about one degree on the Brazil 100 litre there, um, but uh, that is 210 degrees Fahrenheit for you guys in Freedom Units. The Wort flow speed, I kept pretty close to the 4.2 liters per minute. I kept it, you know, plus or minus like about 0.2 liters per minute, I would say. That was getting close to the ball valve being fully open, I'll say as well. Now, for the water flow speed, on the other hand, I had that down at 5.5 liters per minute. Look, I know a lot of people who just want to cool as fast as possible, turn it up to full bore. Look, I was trying to be conservative a little bit with the water, so I slowed it down quite a lot down at the 5.5. You will get better performance results if you crank the water right up to max and just don't care about the water wastage. Now with the test results, as you would probably guess, the plate chiller won this test. So the plate chiller at 31.7 degrees Celsius was the winner. So basically, if you wanna get the highest cooling performance and don't care about cleaning, then the plate chiller obviously is the best choice. Me personally, wouldn't go that route. The Red Reaper on the other hand, that one hit the 34.4 degrees Celsius. That's 93.4. Uh, nine degrees Fahrenheit for those people in freedom units. Now, the worst player was actually the Coolossus. Now, this probably highlights the reason why we use quite a long and large Coolossus. The Coolossus is 9.5 meters long, and I would not recommend any shorter than that. The 9.5 meters, look, I know it makes the Coolossus a bit bulky, but when you're using something like stainless and using a thick stainless tube, you just have to go with that type of size, I guess. And even with that large 9.5, meter coil, you can see that we have a 39.1 degree Celsius cooling performance. So slightly worse than the other two. All of them were pretty close though, to be fair. 
Now you're probably wondering, if I slow the workflow down, will I get better cooling performance? And you absolutely will. So if you slow the workflow down to 2.1 liters per minute, this is what the results look like. Basically, your work temperature will come out at 25.5 degrees Celsius for the plate chiller, 26.9 degrees Celsius for the Red Reaper, and for the Colossus, it'll be 29.1. Now, let's say you wanted to go down to 1.1 liters per minute flow rate on your wort running through the chiller. That's about 0.3 gallons per minute. Per minute. This is pretty slow and you're gonna be there for quite a while, but if you go that slow, the plate chiller is gonna give you results of around about 22.4 degrees Celsius. For the Red Reaper, that's gonna bring the wort down at an output temperature at 23.1 degrees Celsius, and the cool losses will be about 24.3 degrees Celsius. So that's what it's gonna look like. If you slow at that flow, your pitch yeast probably pretty close to straight away. You're gonna be waiting a little bit longer to just get your wort out of your boiler into the fermenter. So in conclusion, which one would I go for? Look, personally, I think the Red Reaper is the best choice out of the lot here. When it comes to price, I would say the Red Reaper is significantly cheaper, about half the price of the Cool Losses. Obviously, a lot less material. It's a smaller, more compact chiller. Um, I honestly, even though the plate chiller has slightly better cooling performance by maybe one or two degrees, in my opinion, I think just the hassles with cleaning are too much for me to overcome. So look, I would never go the plate chiller unless it was one I could fully disassemble. And even as a home brewer, I wouldn't even recommend one to fully disassemble because the amount of time you put into disassembling, putting all those gaskets back together is such a pain in the bum. And the coaxial cleaner, the, the coaxial chillers like these two are just so much easier to clean because they've got a smooth bore all the way through the unit, just come straight out like that. They clean really easily, there's nowhere for like little bits of crud to hide. And the other thing is they drain out better as well. So when you sit, to sit, sit, sit them like that, all the liquid just drains out with gravity out to the output here. Well, you know, more or less pretty well. With the plate chiller, it's nowhere near as good. No matter which orientation you put it in, there's always kind of like a little bit of liquid kind of stored in there. I find that a little bit frustrating. So for me, I would say the Red Reaper wins. The ergonomics of as, as well are pretty good. So then you've got this like hanging hook. I find that kind of quite useful and also the thermo well on the output I would say probably from that perspective is better and we sell it as a kit with fittings it's just pretty cheap so look for something which is half the price of this one it's similarly priced to the 30 plate chiller I would say the Red Reaper is the best way to go. Now, the only exclusion to that would be if you're the kind of person who's a lot of chemicals in your uh, brewery, maybe using caustic soda and you wanna run that through the, the, the chiller as well, and you've got a very high degree of sanitation you're acquiring, then look, maybe this stainless steel Colossus is the way for you. You're gonna pay a little bit extra, or maybe you've just got a beautiful everything stainless kind of brewery and you wanna keep that look everything stainless, then I think you know the Cool Losses probably has its application in that field. So look, I would say either this one or this one, plate chiller, not so much. And if you guys wanna see us do any other comparisons or reviews, definitely put it in the notes uh, below, put it in the comments and then request uh, what you would wanna see next on our next video comparison. Anyway, that's it. Join our Facebook homebrew community group. It's awesome, got lots of guys there, there sharing tips and tricks on how to use all the gear. The other thing it would love to uh, do is for you to subscribe to the video as well. So bottom right hand corner, hit subscribe now. Make sure to hit that bell notification icon. That's where, that way when new videos land, you'll get notified just like that. Um, and you'll know that we've got new product launched. Anyway, that's it and see you guys next time. Bye.